You're listening to The Thrive Podcast, where every week we dive into a practical, tactical tip to bring you from a life of simply surviving to thriving. It's personal development for the everyday girl who is done with coasting through her days, done with feeling like she's missing out on the deeper meaning of her own life, and done with mediocrity once and for all. Because it's not enough to simply survive, you deserve to thrive. Welcome back to Thrive. Today, we're having an important conversation with my new friend, Laura, that maybe you can relate to especially. As a leadership coach and podcaster, Laura's work revolves around helping women navigate change and create sustainable success when you're faced with figuring out what to do when what's expected no longer feels right. In today's episode, we talk about what that actually looks and feels like when you find yourself out of alignment how to trust yourself more as you lean into figuring out what's next on a new path and how to healthily discern and navigate the opinions and expectations of others along the way. Laura drops so many practicals and real advice to help you get from point A to point B with more joy and less stress than you maybe thought possible. So I think this episode will be a helpful one to hear. Stay tuned through this conversation. Drop it five stars if you like what you're listening to. And now, welcome, Laura. Thanks, Erica. I'm excited to be here. Yay. Welcome to Thrive. I'm super excited, especially for this conversation, because it feels all the more relevant, I think, after the past, I don't know, year and a half, almost two years. So many people took the pandemic and so much of the world turning upside down to really reflect on what they want most out of life (laughs) and started asking themselves tougher questions. Like, what do I really want? What am I here for? What is my purpose? Like so much internal digging. And I think with so much internal digging happening, we saw and continue to see uh, so many people come to the conclusion that what they were doing, maybe even for a really long time, no longer felt right, was no longer their jam. And some sort of shift or some sort of change or a lot of change was going to be necessary. So this brings us to you and what you do (laughs) and share. So without stealing your thunder, tell us your story and how you got to the point that you're at today. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, that's a long story, Erica, (laughs) as I'm sure everyone... (laughs) everyone says, but I mean, just to quickly, you know, actually I'm going to start at the end and then circle back. I mean, to, to sort of talk a little bit about what you were saying. Yes. I, I completely agree with you. And I think it's part of why I kept having that conversation that you just talked about with women, like all summer long, like I was, you know, I was sort of out and about as we all were, we were sort of out and about for a little bit of time over the summer before we realized that Delta had kicked in and we kind of had to dial it back again. And, you know, I just kept having these serendipitous conversations with women of all ages that they felt like they didn't know what to do next. And, and I think the other thing that I saw was this great sense of relief when I would tell them, you know what, I'm in my forties and I'm figuring it out again. Like you're going to do that multiple times in your life. And there would be this deep sense of relief, like, especially from, from younger women in their, you know, in their twenties and early thirties, they would say, Oh my God, really? (laughs) Cause they felt like it was just them. And so I think that for me, that's what ultimately led me to, um, change the focus of my podcast. She knows the way to really focus on that conversation. So I just want to say that because I think, you know, it's very relevant to what you're saying and the, the timeliness of it. Yes. I think the pandemic just amped up those feelings that maybe were already brewing and there just doesn't seem to be a place where women are talking about this all the time. Um, so having said that, I mean, my story, you know, like, where shall I begin? I mean, I, I started from a, from a career perspective, I started my career in entertainment Um working for a startup game company in Seattle originally. And from there made my way into television um, where I stayed for, you know, over a decade living in New York city, um, working on the business side of television. So on the advertising side of things. Um, And I have to say, it's funny now being a media producer in podcasting for five years to now being circling back to the media industry, but on the, on the creator side, it's a totally different, you know, kind of, um, experience. But 
you know, what led me to have these kinds of conversations with women ultimately when I, so I left the entertainment industry, um, when the market crashed actually in at the end of 2008, 2009, um, and took a, a sort of sharp left turn into, uh, the health and wellness space and, um, went back to school, studied, you know, health coaching, um, and grew a business over about 10 years around that. Um, and so what that ultimately turned into though, was more leadership conversations because of the women that I was talking to. So it sort of turned into this hybrid of, um, leadership coaching, executive coaching, health coaching, um, which ultimately led me to then design leadership experiences for large organizations. But I mentioned that because my podcast actually started um, as a marketing tool for that health coaching business. So it's it's different. It, it, it's different now in the sense that, and I think this you know maybe is relevant to people thinking about like how they want to do things differently. That happened for me during the pandemic too. Like I had sort of put my business on pause because it just didn't feel like the right thing. And that happened really in 2019, but towards the end of 2019, I was still feeling around for what was next for me. And I started to look out to do work with other organizations and see what that would feel like again. And so my podcast was no longer relevant as a marketing tool, right? And so I had this wonderful opportunity to step back from it and say, okay, what do I want this thing to be as a creator? It's separate from my business now. It doesn't have a business purpose per se. Um, what do I want it to be? And that's when these conversations with women started happening. Like it just, and it just sort of happened organically. Um, and so this idea of, you know, she knows the way and this conversation around deciding what's next when doing what's expected no longer feels right really resonates with people, um, whether they're women or not, but I think, you know, it's just that women are, that's just where I've focused my, my, um, content creation for years. So it's just my comfort zone. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a short ish, short, longish version of my story, <laughs> my business story, at least. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting too. And I think it makes so much sense when you said, you hear, you'll hear these women, especially younger women, give a sigh of relief when you're like, Hey, listen, I'm in my forties and I'm, I'm doing it all over again now. And I always wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that for so long, when we're kids, we're growing up and everyone's asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? And there's this pressure to kind of figure it all out between the ripe young ages of 18 and 22, if you're in college and then you graduate and you're supposed to be like on this trajectory. And it's a, it's a, it's a one-stop rocket ship launch in one direction. And there aren't necessarily courses that you're taking in college on, I don't know, like what to do if you decide in five years, 10 years, that this is totally not what you want to do anymore. <laughs> like, yeah. so people will, it's easier, I think sometimes to stay in the familiar instead of doing what might feel more comfortable or more aligned with what you truly want to do. And it's scary for people to hit the panic button and go, oh my gosh, uh, I actually hate this thing that I spent a ton of money trying to get into, or that I spent so much time investing trying to get into. And there's so many complicated emotions and things that kind of, uh, go into that. So yeah, yeah. that one resonates <laughs> totally. I'm sure well, with many people. Yeah. It's funny. I, I, so many things came up for me when you were saying that, I think one thing is, um, I'm sure, you know, uh, Adam Grant, he's a professor at, at Wharton, which I believe he was my, he was, uh, my favorite, my professor. I loved him. Well, there he's you go. Wonderful. I was like, I'm like, I'm sure you know him. So he, is, I do. Yeah. He is one of my, you know, my leadership go-to folks, not surprisingly. Right. Yeah. So, um, he talks about that in his recent book, think again, yes. he talks about, I know exactly where you're kids, going right? with this. It's so good. Yeah. Where we ask kids what they want to be when they grow up and it's instead of what they want to do in general, like what, you know, like, what are you doing? And so it's an evolution. Right. And I, so I, I just, yes. I think that's right. And it does put us in these boxes, um, that, you know, it's so interesting because even though now the sort of, you know, quote unquote gig economy is, is a bigger piece of what we're all doing career-wise, like more of us are 
freelancers um, or, you know, small business owners than has ever happened in, you know, at least in, in my lifetime. And yet at the same time, I, I'm, I speak for myself because I started my career in, in the corporate space. I mean, I worked for large television networks because I started there. I sometimes still struggle with those expectations of like fitting in a box, right? Like, yeah. no, you have to specialize in this thing and that's all you can do. And that's what people know you for. Um, and that's great. Like some people really thrive in that kind of environment. I am not one of them. And it took me a really long time to not only figure that out, but also to sort of embrace it and be like, you know yeah. what? I'm not a specialist. I I'm actually really good at a lot of different things. And yes, there's a thread. I mean, like I'm a marketer by trade. Like I can always come up with a, a storyline or a thread, but I no longer apologize for doing lots of different things. And what may look to the outside, like I'm you know, sort of pivoting every few years. Cause it's not, to me, it's not that it's just different things get amped up at different times. Right. Like I focus on, on different areas of my portfolio of work at different times, um, depending on what I'm interested in on how I can add value to people who I'm in contact with. Like all, there are all kinds of things, um, that come yeah. up, but yes, you're right. It's scary. Yeah. It's scary. If you grew up in that environment where you're like, no, no, you do this thing. There's one thing. You follow that one thing for the rest of your life. <laughs> and I, to give, a, I want to repeat what Adam says since we, we brushed over it because I think it's so helpful because he uses it as a tool that he recommends teaching kids to reframe that conversation with kids about what to do with your life. But I actually think as we're talking about this, I'm like, it's actually super relevant to grownups too, yeah, in terms absolutely. of, um, figuring it out, figuring out what you want to do instead of a role that you want to be. So it's kind yeah. of more, more figuring out what kind of person do you, what kind of person, it, I guess it kind of is twofold. It could be like, what kind of person do you want to be? Or what do you want to do from like a day-to-day -day task standpoint? Mm -hmm. Not what do you want to be like your one job title that is your thing for the rest of your life. So yeah. that might, it looks totally different because that might be something like, all right, I'm going to take a step back. I, I know I love to write. So I want to be writing or I want to do writing every, every single day. Okay. Well that opens the door to a lot more opportunities and to a lot, a lot more job descriptions than one specific thing that you might've thought is the one thing that fits that bill. If that makes sense, it really yeah. allows you, but I think what, what's great about that is it also makes it allows you to do something where every single day, you know, you're doing what you love to do because you're going off of what the actual, what the actual tasks and life looks like instead of just what looks good on paper. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, because there are, there are roles and, and professions or whatever you want to call them that like we haven't even dreamed up yet. Right. So like, if you can focus on the activities that you want to do or the, th you know, the things that go into that, like you said, in, in your day-to-day -day life, you may come up with a, a, a job as it were that no one's ever thought of yeah. before. Right. And, and, but yeah, it's really, it is, it's really scary. If you've, if you've only worked in a, a more corporate environment, which, which, does well because it tends to force people into specializations. And again, some people thrive in that, but, um, I, I think I just, it's like, I want people to know that there's a different way. And, and I should also say, it's not like, um, I mean, the women that I talk to on my podcast, aren't all entrepreneurs. They're not all sort of taking quote unquote, different paths. Some of them um, are still working in the corporate space and finding their way there, right? It's more about like understanding that helping women understand that they have the answers to the question, what's next for me? Like no one else has that answer. And so I, I personally find hearing other women's stories so helpful in, in answering my own what's next. That's, and that's the kind of conversation that we're having on the show. Um, yeah you know, and it, it's, it's really just born out of my curiosity about, okay, what was your journey? And 
you know, this season, we just happen to be, we're recording this in, in November, we happen to be talking about career, but that won't always be the case, right? Because this is an interesting conversation to have, you know, as it relates to, you know, your body, to your family, to your relationships or whatever, like, how do you decide what's next in all of these areas of your life? And how do you learn to trust that you do know the way, you know? Yeah. What do you think it looks like or feels like when you first start getting that feeling in your stomach that the path that you are currently on might no longer be the right path for you? Mm, oh my gosh. Well, I can tell you how it showed up for me. Um, the first that, that brought back a really, <clears throat> excuse me, a really powerful memory actually, um, that I haven't thought about in a while. This was uh, when I was working in New York and um, for a, a large corporation. And I was super excited to be there. Like I was very intentional about, I mean, I've always been very intentional about the the work that I do, but I was very intentional about going after these jobs and I got them. And here I was in this, you know, well-known corporation, um, working for, you know, television networks that everyone knows. And I got into the elevator one day I walked in into the the building um, in Midtown Manhattan, and it was this. It had like slate walls, and like it was this re- like giant ceilings and like really fancy fixtures, and it was very stately, I guess. And I got into the elevator, and I felt like I was suffocating. And this was probably a few years in. Like I had already been there for a couple of years, um, maybe even longer at this point. And I just remember having this very distinct feeling like I was suffocating and it was bizarre. So that was the first, and I, I'd never experienced that before because I've been working in the, these kinds of jobs for years. And, and so that was the first inkling for me that there's something about this that doesn't fit me anymore. And I, I could not possibly have articulated it at that point. Um, so, and it was years before I then left, you know, that environment to look for something new. So I stayed there and, 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 but I think listening to your body, I guess that's where I'm going with this is that's usually how it shows up for me. And it's a, it's a question of whether or not I listen. So, you know, that feeling of being feeling suffocated, you know, I've had other situations where it just had this sense that something was off. Like I didn't fit. Right. Like but it always, for me, it always manifests as a physical sensation. Like, you know, it feels like, you know, my stomach just feels butterflies or again, that sort of suffocation feeling like I can't breathe or there's always some physical manifestation of it for me. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's learning to ident- identify what that is for you and then actually paying attention to it. Mm-hmm. What is it, what so is it I- for you, Erica? Like, I'm curious what, what happens to you? in those situations? Um, I would say for me personally, my faith plays a big role in it. So I pray a lot and will, I, I feel like that's kind of what ends up being my guiding light. If things are, you know, not the right path anymore, because I lose a sense of peace. So for me, it very much, if I am not on the right track with something, there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, a lot of tension, a lot of just, um, general uneasiness. It's not necessarily as much of a physical manifestation, I would say as much as it is, as it is a mental thing, where I just know that, like you said, something is just off. And for me, it's, it's very much a lack of peace. Like it is, it is just, I just know something's not right here. Um, and something's got to change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, and I think I'm glad you brought up faith practices because I think whatever that looks like for you, you know, you know, for me, it shows up as, you know, meditation and, you know, physical practices like running and that sort of thing. Like to me, that's how I sort of center myself and and connect with, you know, that whatever that is that you think of as bigger than you. And I, but I think that's really important to have. I mean, it sounds so cliche, like, yes, of course, everyone's meditating, you know, like it sounds so cliche but there's a reason that it's cliche. And I am someone who is pretty like, generally speaking, I'm pretty quote unquote high strung. Like my brain is always going a million miles an hour. And I'm like, so I, in order to actually discern my way forward, right. And discern what the right next step is. 
I have to have practices that center me and it's different for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, if I didn't exercise regularly, I would be in big trouble. If I didn't meditate regularly, I would never get anything done. And it took me again, a long time to figure that out. Um, I think sometimes you need to be able to slow down and be still to figure out how to go forward again, Absolutely, because you're not just going to be able to power through, power through, power through at some point, those steps forward are going to be a lot smaller to the point where you might end up going the opposite direction. If you're not taking the time to actually regroup, actually recenter and figure out, am I still at the right pace? Am I still at the right direction? Are we still going on the right path period? Because otherwise it can have, it can have the opposite effect. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. One of the first conversations I had on this season of she knows the way is with a woman named Christine McHugh, who, um, worked at Starbucks for 27 years. I mean, she was there very long. She started as a barista, like she dropped out of college, um, got a a job as a barista and then made her way up in the organization. But the, the conversation that we had was very specifically about taking career breaks because of exactly what you're saying. Like the idea of taking a break freaks some people out you know, for, for sometimes for good reason, but, you know, Christine's point was I would not have been able to figure out what was next, whether it was what was next inside Starbucks or what was next, you know, when she eventually left, like she took, I think like, I want to say three kind of sabbaticals during the, those 27 years. And she talks a lot about, yeah, how that helped her make a decision to move forward in whatever Mm -hmm. way that showed up. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think as people who are, and I, again, I speak for myself as people who are used to pushing things forward, I have had to learn. And now I'm much better at catching it early, but like I've had to learn when that's not working anymore. And it, for me, it happens every couple of weeks. Like I have this moment where I'm like, I'll wake up in the morning and I will have been driving something forward, like driving some project forward or, or you know, whatever. And I'll wake up and I'll be like, okay, I think today needs to be a just roll with it kind of day. Like I yes. don't, I'm not going to have a task list today. I'm just going to see what presents itself. And I'm going to do that because otherwise, if I keep pushing, I, I burn out literally, yeah. you know, yeah. it's a dance. Yeah. I think you're totally right. I am the same way. <laughs> so I can 100% relate. Um, I think though, that once once you make that decision or have that discovery that there are a few different potential next steps, depending on your next choice, do you stay on the path that is maybe familiar, but no longer comfortable, or do you get a little uncomfortable in the unfamiliar and try a new path that may be a better fit? So in considering those options, there are a few things that come up uh, first. So if you're considering switching paths, be that in your career, in a relationship, other people's opinions and other people's expectations may come up. So their thoughts uh, or fears may come out and they might be projected onto you, especially if you are making what may seem like a more unconventional or untraditional or unfamiliar choice of work in work or life to them. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with those opinions or those expectations of others? And how do you discern whether or not they're worth taking into consideration along the way? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the first part is just what we were talking about. You have to be really clear on your values and what you want to be doing and how you want to show up in the world first. Like that has to happen first, because until you get to that place, it can be really hard to not take in all of this external feedback. Right. And it's hard anyway, even when you are clear, you're sometimes like, "Mm, wait a minute, maybe that person's right. Like you, it's, you know, you can still second guess yourself, but you're going to be a lot less likely to do that. If you're, if you've taken the time to get centered and, and focus on how you want to show up. I think Mm -hmm. the other thing that's been really helpful for me is recognizing that often those opinions or fears are coming from people who, well, yeah, they're afraid for you, right? They're afraid that you will get hurt or that you will not be successful or whatever it is. And because they love you, they want to make sure that you don't do that. Right. So 
that sometimes helps me, I think, because it helps me not get frustrated <laughs> quite as much with all of that external feedback to, to understand that generally, not always, but, but especially from people close to you, it's coming from a place of love. Um, and I think what I have learned to do is say, thank you so much for your input. This is really, it's a really interesting way to think about this. Um, and I, I'm definitely going to consider that because then they feel heard. Right. And this is something that, you know, I think in a, in a, just in a business space where you're collaborating with people is a useful, a useful tool to be able to say that and acknowledge people's input, but it doesn't mean you have to listen to it. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, it all comes back to like, how centered are you in how you want to show up in the world and what you want to be doing and what lights you up and how you add value? Because until you get there, you won't be able to take, take it or leave it basically. Yeah. I love that. Do you have, I would love to hear if you have any more tips on maybe continuing that conversation with people or effectively communicating with these people if they are projecting fear onto you, especially if this is a bigger life decision that it's going to come up at more than just the Thanksgiving table or something like (laughs) something that it's going to continue to be there. So I'm sure we've all experienced it maybe from a close family member or a friend where there's still an important relationship, or it's one that we can't just cut out of our lives completely if they disagree with us, or maybe saying thank you for your input will only go so far because they push (laughs) or they're like persistent and they, and they, it's still something where it's going to keep coming up. So if there's something, if, if it comes to the point where you realize, okay, I either need to talk about this more or I need to talk about it less and actually have a boundary put in place. How, how do you recommend doing that? So that it's something where if it's not just a full stop, cool, heard your opinion. Thank you for your input. Appreciate it. We'll take it into consideration. I'm going my own way. If it's something that's going to, going to keep pestering. Yeah. How how do you handle? Yeah. It's a good question. Well, it comes, it, it comes down to what you were saying. Like you have to decide to create a boundary. Right. And, but what does that boundary look like? Um, and you know, I I should say I'm not a psychologist, but I will say, you know, (laughs) um, I can share how that's showed up for me. I think, you know, I've had to have some honest conversations with, with usually it's members of my family. Like, let's just be honest, (laughs) um, where I've just had to say to them, listen, I love you. And I, and I, I, I recognize that you want to know about this part of my life. And I really appreciate that. And it's really hard for me to talk to you about this particular thing. Um, so I would appreciate it if we just maybe talked about other things and I can share other things with you about what I'm working on or whatever. You know, I think for me, it's been like, what am I, com- what am I comfortable sharing with them? Like, what am I, where am I comfortable bringing them in? Because Ultimately, I think, especially for the people who love us, it's about making them feel included in some way, right? So I feel like if, if, if you can find another way to include them, that isn't that thing that you don't want to talk to them about, <laughs> that sometimes that can be helpful, right? Because you're maintaining, you're, you're still building and maintaining the relationship. You've just said to them, this particular topic is just feels off limits to me. Um, and it's not because you did anything wrong. It's just, you know, I'm, I have other people in my life that I talk about this thing. And I'd like to talk with you about this other thing, because I find that that's really helpful for me. So Mm -hmm. sometimes people are even more difficult than that, but that's about, I, I, you know, as far as I think I've been able to take it, um, there are just certain things that I, that I don't talk to certain people about. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once you've gotten those tougher conversations out of the way. Maybe you kind of hit the, hit the incoming opinions and the expectations of other people. And you're like, all right, I feel confidence in the direction in like change has to happen. What do you think is step one of discerning your way forward now and really beginning to trust yourself more once you've made that decision of like, all right, I'm going to change. I'm not going to take other people's opinions and expectations and let that be my guiding light. I'm going to figure this out. What is the step one for that, that first big step forward? Well, I actually think it's not a big step forward. I think it's always an experimentation. 
Love you know, that. whether it's a change in your career or a change in the way you take care of yourself physically, mentally, whatever, it's an experimentation. Because I think what I've seen, you know, in my years of coaching women in particular, although I've had male coaching clients where this comes up too, but we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to get it right. Like if we're going to yes. go a different direction, we're like, oh, I have to be perfect. I can't do it until <laughs> I'm going to be perfect. Right. <laughs> um, and so this frame of experimentation takes that pressure off because really all you're doing is trying something to see if it works for you and gathering data, right? Like if you can think of it that way, whether it's in your business or in your life, all you're doing is trying it out, gathering inputs so that you can make a better decision about how to move forward from there. And I think that's all we can do. Um, there's actually a really great book that I have found helpful along those lines. It's called Designing Your Life. It's by the, I always forget the author's names. It's um, the guys who run the Stanford Design Lab. Um, and the story behind the book, hopefully I'm getting this right, but the story is that they, you know, one of them was teaching a design thinking class at Stanford for years. And students started ask, graduating students would come to them and say, well, you know, I don't know what to do with my life. Like I'm graduating college. What am I supposed to do? And so they ultimately created this program specifically for that purpose. But the book is written in such a way that it, it applies design thinking to just these kinds of choices, right? And part of design thinking is prototyping, right? So you're prototyping, you're experimenting, right? Like that's how a designer would approach creating a new product. They're not entirely sure what that new product looks like. So they have to prototype their way forward. Um, and so anyway, I definitely recommend that book for people who want very concrete ways to, to think about that. But ultimately it comes down to, it's all an experiment. Everything yeah. is an experiment. I love that too, because I think so often we forget that you don't actually have to be a finished product right out of the gate. And that's actually uh, probably impossible for like, yeah. I don't know, nine out of 10, 9.5 out of 10 cases. <laughs> like there's never, there's never a case study where someone was like, you know what, I'm going to try this new thing. And then like snapped their fingers and they were the next best expert at it. Like it takes yeah. time. It takes practice. So I love that you mentioned that because I think that's so important to remember, especially when we see the social media highlight reels of people and the success stories. And we don't get to, we're not necessarily privy to everybody's practice field. Like we, we are all works in progress all the time, even as you're working toward in that field that you now decide is the right thing for you. So you have to give yourself that grace along the way that you're not necessarily going to get it right, right away. And you're not maybe going to get it right the second time you try it either. It's just important that you keep going once you realize that you are in alignment with what, what feels better for, for you. Yeah. And what does right look like? Right. I mean, that's what comes up for me, like getting yeah. it right. Like, I don't even know what that looks like. And I think, you know, that's a conversation that I have with myself all the time. Like what, what does success look like in this particular, you know, yeah. and, and it changes like, you know, it changes from year to year, sometimes from month to month, sometimes from day to day. And I think, again, it always comes back for me to tuning into your self Yes. And experimenting enough to know how to do that so that you can answer that question because it's a moving target. I mean, oh my gosh, if you all could see inside my head, like most days, like, you know, it's <laughs> oh, just, same. I feel you, right? It's chaos some days and other days it's very focused and clear. Yeah. Um, and I get frustrated on the days where it's not focused and clear. And then someone very wise, you know, in my life reminds me that it's, it's just an ebb and a flow, right? Yeah. And you can't have one without the other. And it's, again, it all sounds so cliche, but there's a reason that it, but it's true. Right. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Oh, it really is. So as, as you keep moving forward, redefining everything and refocusing on new targets, since they are constantly moving, are there any specific questions that you recommend asking yourself to kind of continuously check in while you're navigating change to make sure that things at least are still feeling aligned along the way? Yeah. So one question that I started to ask myself this summer, as I was once again, embarking on some kind of, you know, career shift, which by the way, is still in progress. So, you know, it's always in progress, as you said, is what do I need to learn? And the reason that I asked myself that is because I was sitting here thinking, okay, 
I want to get to from point A to point B. There's some things that I'm not real clear about that, you know, between those two points, what do I need to learn to get there? And then once I was able to identify the things that I needed to learn, it made it a lot easier to understand what people I needed to reach out to, right? Or what books I needed to read or what courses I need, whatever it was to fill that knowledge gap. So that's one, you know, what do I need to learn to get from point A to point B? Um, it, it really breaks it down, I think. Um, and then the other one is just what we were talking about, which is checking in, I really think every day, every week to understand, okay, what does success look like for me now? What are the priorities is, you know, and, and really having a list of what those things are like, is it, um, that I need to make more money? That's fine. That's perfectly fine. It might not be at the top of your list, but that could be on there. Is it that I need to feel more aligned with my values? Um, is it that I need to feel like I'm part of or building a team? Is it like what, you know, make a list of like 10, you know, mine is like 10 different things that I sometimes reorder in terms of what the end game is and what's the most important because you got to prioritize, right? Like this, whatever the situation is that you're moving towards is probably not going to check all the boxes. So what are the top three that must be checked off? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think those are the, those are the questions that have been really coming up for me a lot recently. I also probably check in daily on like, how does this feel? Like, does this thing bring me joy? Does this thing that I'm doing bring me joy? And I get that they're parts of work and life that aren't joyful. <laughs> like, I get that. It can't be all joy all the time. But I would like a high percentage of my day to be in a space that I feel connected to. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the other question. In fact, this woman, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember this woman that I'm in a business group with just this morning posted, she was talking about, um, wanting to operationalize joy in her business, meaning that she had identified that joy was one of her prior priorities in her business for herself and for the people that work with her. And how do we operationalize this? And so I can't remember the exact questions that she wanted to ask, but it was about taking time at the end of a project or maybe even in the middle to say, what about this project was joyful? What about it was not, right? And so that you have a, a way to operationalize it. It's built into the process of your work or of your day. Um, so maybe that's just another nugget that I found really interesting. Yeah, I love that. So now we're getting to the end here and I got to ask you something that I ask everyone on Thrive. So that is, what does thrive mean to you and how do you strive to thrive in your everyday life? Mm. Thriving to me generally comes back to feeling mentally clear and feeling physically strong, which are connected, mm. right? Um, so it's not a, a huge surprise that I, you know, my sort of second big career was in the, in the you know, fitness and health and wellness space, because for me, that's always been, those two things have always come in tandem. So in order to feel mentally clear, I need to be physically strong <laughs> in order to be physically strong. I need to be mentally able to, you know, do those physical things. Like for me, it's running and, and bar and so on and so forth. Um, and when those things are true, I feel like I'm thriving. I, I think I'll also add, this is something that I, um, uh, came across with my coach that I work with, who I've worked with for a number of years. And she talks about this concept of, I'm going to come back to the idea of joy, but she calls it, what's your brand of joy? Um, and identifying like what your brand of joy is, right? So that that becomes a compass for you. And my brand of joy in this framework, and this came after lots of work, right? Is this idea of expansion. So I want to feel expansive in my work and my days most of the time. And what that means is that I, what, what I've come to understand is it means that I need to feel present. I need to feel connected and I need to feel like I'm discovering things. So if those three elements are present, I feel expansive and thus I feel like I'm thriving. So that was kind of a long answer, but for me, that's I love it. Up. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I'm sitting here just like, yes, I like this too. I think my brand of joy is also expansive. 
expansive. Yes, and <laughs> it I should feels give a- right. So yeah, expansive is great. And, but I think what was especially helpful was identifying what are the three, and I can't remember what she calls them. Her name is Tanya Geisler for anyone who wants to look her up. She was actually a guest on my podcast years, years ago when it was still called women on the rise. But you know, what's helpful is I just, I know that if I feel present, connected, and in a sense of discovery, I'm going to automatically feel expansive. And those three things being present, connected and in a sense of discovery are easier to kind of create, right? Like I can affect that. Like, like, for example, one of the reason I, one of the reasons I love podcasting, I think is that it feels like it touches on all of those things, right? I'm in a sense of discovery because I'm talking to new people and I'm learning from their stories. I feel connected to them, right? As I'm having those conversations and I'm present because as an interviewer and, and this comes from being a coach too, you have to be present with the person in front of you. Um, And so I think that's part of the reason I love that. It's part of the reason I love, you know, coaching. It's part of the reason I love leadership development and all the different things that I do sort of scratch that itch. Um, And on a day where I can't put those three elements into my work, I I just, you know, that happens. And I just know that I won't feel quite as expansive on that day. That's all right. But then you appreciate it all the more the next day when it happens. Totally. (laughs) well laura thank you so much for coming on thrive this has been an awesome conversation tell everybody where they can find you online to connect with you more yeah absolutely well you can find the she knows the way podcast pretty much everywhere um anywhere you get get podcasts you can also go to my website at lauradolch.com slash podcast and just go directly there um, to listen if that's easier so yeah Wait, before you go, make sure you're subscribed to never miss an episode of Thrive. Drop five stars on your way out if you like what you just listened to. And come join the party on Instagram at thrive.podcast to stay inspired and thriving all week long. Thanks for tuning in. It's your time to thrive.